I do want to mention we have uh, Brian in the room who has been poached by our measles colleagues, uh, who was at the ABM training, but is going to be giving a longer presentation at measles at 1.30. Um, so this is our very last uh, then uh, uh, team going, our zero dose team. Welcome. All right. Thank you. Good morning, evening. I'm in a good afternoon. Good evening from wherever you're logged in from. I'm taking cognizance of the people joining us online. My name is Mambo. And I'm standing here on behalf of a team that was working on agent-based modeling in predicting number of um, uh, uh, vaccinations needed to achieve a 50% reduction in zero-dose vaccination in Kenya in under five children. And just key facts about... Next. Okay. I will take the next one minute, then I can invite my colleague. Um, uh, and key facts about uh, um, vaccination, um, it helps in prevention of diseases as well as um, uh, improving heart immunity. Um, and that's also, it's okay, key for us to note that it also helps in, the, it's a very cost-effective intervention and helps in lifelong protection. And why zero dose is because um, it's a critical objective uh, in global health and um, is actually at the heart of immunization agenda 2030. And Gavi defines zero dose as children that who lack the first dose of uh, DPT um, one that is administered within the six weeks uh, from birth as uh, Kenya expanded program of immunization the schedule. Uh, next please. And why, why um, the gap? the gap on uh, the zero dose. I think it's important for us to note that uh, vaccination is one of the major um, interventions that really works. And it's important for us to know that for Kenya, currently um, zero dose is at estimated at around 7%, 7 indicating that at least seven in, in 100 children under one year of age did not receive any vaccination. Our next place, um, rushing against time. And we tried to, please next, we tried to, um, we tried to uh, um, mod or rather to simulate through the SIS model. And why is it that the uh, SIR model not work for this uh, particular um, uh, aspect of vaccination is because uh, really it's less applicable to diseases like tetanus where vaccinations um, uh, really require, um, they are really not long lasting. And at the same time, why SIS model? because um, it, it is really uh, not conferred with, uh, through natural immunity. Next, please. Yes, allow me to quickly ask Dr. Bitsy to take up on the model. Thank you very much. Zero to, uh, does we work in a team and we have our two members online. So thank you. So um, we recruited um, agents um, who are under five and uh, they missed um, uh, zero dose, or there was zero dose agents. So those are the ones we included. And um, we sampled on tetanus because um, currently in Kenya, the diphtheria is under control. Um, pertussis is also under control. So the only case we were able to pick on was um, the tetanus cases, just to because of the DPT. Uh, we also have the pentadose. Um, we sampled on um, the standard the DPT. So currently, um, these are the tetanus cases in Kenya. We use this is real time data from the Ministry of Health um, based on the KH, uh, KHIS uh, system that we use in Kenya. So this is real time data. So the question was uh, how many cases are we able to avert if we reduce the zero dose? Uh, cases by 50%. Uh, globally, um, attribution of tetanus is about uh, 50,000 cases. And um, out of those cases, 34,000 die uh, because um, fatality case, case fatality of uh, tetanus is about 78%. So um, once you have tetanus, then the chance of this child dying uh, quite high. So Kenya, uh, mortality cases uh, attributed to tetanus um, is uh, 2348 or 2348. So we adopted the um, STASI model and um, based on the probability of 0 0.25 and the efficacy of the tetanus vaccine being 0 0.9, 
then we were able to realize that uh, we could avert about 75 cases per month. So um, this is our model before we did the calibration. But after calibration, then we realized that um, we are able to avert about uh, 1,670 cases if we enhanced our uh, vaccination to ensure that the zero dose cases are identified and administered with the, the DPT or the pentadose um, vaccine um, in Kenya. So um, this is uh, uh, the conclusion from our model. Um, but um, we realize that um, modeling alone is not enough, so we need to go to the next step and uh, we need to enhance our um, vaccination. And uh, we propose uh, as a team to go on a community-based intervention whereby we are able to um, pick these cases right from the community and looking at the factors that affect these uh, zero-dose cases. Uh, so that is our next uh, uh, plan or the other option also is to come up with a, a high-potency uh, tetanus infection so that uh, we are able to avert these cases. So the team... Um, as of now is we are ready to publish our work. We already have a manuscript ready to to publish, thanks uh, to IDM for the support. So that's where we are at Zero Dose and uh, together we'll be able to bring the, the challenge to a halt. Thank you very much. One burning question for this team, and then I, I'm trapped to know to get out of here. Any questions? Okay, sounds good. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, congratulations to all the speakers. Really, um, really, really interesting. Uh, the result, I believe this, sorry, I came in a little bit late, but I believe it was the result of a workshop that was done with these teams. So really great. I do, I was wondering, this is a burning question for all of them, in fact, and it's, I'm wondering if there is uh, on the horizon, the thought of considering socioeconomic determinants of health inequalities, since a lot of the, maybe all of them, pointed to disparities of some sort. Uh, among the population studies, and I did notice there wasn't necessarily any socioeconomic variables being considered um, to understand uh, these these disparities, which I feel might help in then develop. Which uh, links to my next question, which is, how do these findings? How will they make their way to policymakers? Uh, because, as we know. Uh, scientific publications are not necessarily the channel for that audience. And even though I saw suggestions in another session to have a AI <laughs> do that, I do believe in kind of human health communication specialists. Uh, so I was wondering if there's any work in that sense, as people um, that work with Agnes might know, we at CDAX do a lot of, like make a lot of effort to translate knowledge created by a scientific a population. So this is a question for everybody and I guess maybe we can have everyone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All the speakers come back up. And we have a couple online too. So if they yeah. if okay. they raise their hand, if you have a response online. Okay, I can um, answer about uh, the issue of vaccination. Yeah, social demographic is a key issue in um, immunization um, in Kenya. And especially um, we having this 7% and um, it's, it's a very small number, but the impact is quite huge uh, in terms of um, the outcome. So. Um, in terms of social ease, we find this occurring among the, the less educated, um, the ones living in the rural. Uh, those are the ones affected because they have to travel to access the vaccination. 
And if they come to the health center and uh, they miss because, you know, the, the vaccination is you cannot access easily in the rural area because of the, um, the, the refrigeration process that is needed through the, the Kenya enhanced um, uh, program of immunization. So you must have the, the refrigeration that is needed, you know, the, that is a challenge. So um, if there would be issues in terms of where we can have the green energy involved so that the vaccines can be assessed, um, right, accessed right in the rural areas, right in the remote areas, then we would be able to really reduce the zero dose cases and reduce the distance that they have to travel because the economic issues also come in, the time, the, the road network will really bring in and uh, we can see the impact that um, it's been tough to achieve the 7%. So social is very key. Thank you. Allow me to add this, that right now in Kenya, we have something called point of care that is being implemented through the community strategy um, that is rolled uh, down to the communities through community health promoters. So it's one of the uh, major interventions that is going to revolutionize this. And we hope that it can actually close the gap between uh, the 7% that we're talking about, the zero dose. Thank you. So I really appreciate that question. Yeah, I just wanted to say something small about communicating evidence, but also having this evidence get to policymakers. Our group has been very intentional because we we know the power of this information getting to the policymakers. So even when we are making parameter estimations, when we were in Sydney, Nairobi, we were in touch with the ministry officials in Uganda to get us some of the surveillance data, but also to share with us what was happening. The, the good news is that even when we had preliminary results uh, from Nairobi, I shared with the commissioner in charge of data who had given us the data, and he was very excited that it was uh, pointing out evidence to Rift Valley fever. He told me, can we have an abstract written from this work and we have an epidemiological bulletin for the, for the ministry. But I told him, you wait a minute, because we still wanted to do some refining ourselves here. Lucky enough, last week, I was with them in Cape Town for the World One Health Congress, and they have scheduled us for two weeks. Actually, the commissioner has handed over to the technical team to facilitate the technical science. And once the technical team is happy, they will schedule a top management meeting to discuss our results. Yeah. Um, something to add on the policy is um, we are glad as Jomo Kenyatta University to work directly with the Ministry of Health in this area. So we are also working on how we can bring in implementation science to really try and uh, involve uh, all parties to try and uh, come up with a new policy in terms of vaccination. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that question. I will be talking regarding the family planning. <laughs> yeah, so if you if you look at uh, uh, our next steps that we uh, itemized, uh, I did mention that uh, we are going to look at uh, quite a number of things and that uh, which, which are not limited just only to the socioeconomic factors. We're going to look at uh, the, the, the accessibility to the health facilities because in these uh, uh, slum areas that we are looking at, there's so much uh, disparities in accessing uh, health facilities and uh, uh, accessing proper uh, guidance on the use of uh, contraceptions. And uh, uh, this is something that we actually are going to rely on the uh, uh, update of the new EPSIM program that uh, was uh, discussed uh, on Monday. And then number two, we're going to look at the, the cost effectiveness as an extension of uh, this work, just to see, okay, you know, at, 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 at what at what cost do we enhance campaigns, and uh, uh, at what cost do we involve a male, and at what cost do we uh, look at the health facilities in order to uh, try to meet the target. And I think on one week ago, on the 26th, uh, there was a, a contraceptive awareness uh, uh, in, in Kenya, which was run in a rural area, similar settings, but in a rural area, and uh, such concerns were raised because there's so much uh, of unmet needs of the contraceptions in the slums and those rural areas. And those are the things we're going to look at. And uh, in terms of the policy, I think based on the results that we're going to have, we uh, work with, of course, the, the policymakers and uh, derive policy briefs that can be uh, essential in uh, informing policy and helping accelerate the use of contraceptions in these areas. And I think uh, uh, Agnes can add something on that. <laughs> 
yeah, I could wrap up. Is it on? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so just just to bring um, the responses to your context, Valentina, if you look at the five social determinants of health, I think they do affect almost all the outcomes, the immunization, reach, uh, the family planning access for the persons who are seeking um, access to care after family fever, uh, immunization, and and I think even the cryptical meningitis work. If you look at the environment where the uh, the respondents are and the um, the the, um, the education. I mean, we've seen that the lower the education, the lower the access to family planning. If you look at the economic stability, the ability to get to a health facility and um, the other determinants around the environment, I think are going to be critical to informing the models. But what we're also seeing is that digital determinants of health, we know that about 90% of people in Africa have access to a phone, but how do they use that phone? Do they use it to get access to critical information that affects their health access and uh, all the determinants around their health literacy? So we are going to incorporate that. I know we want to do some work around assessing the determinants, social and digital determinants of health in African context, and maybe at IDM 2026, we'll be here <laughs> to see what this looks like, particularly in the context of um, the diverse the diverse uh, countries that we are working in, in part of our Inspire Network, to just see what are the determinants of health that can actually inform different health outcomes. So it's work in progress. Thank you. Um, speaking to contact networks, I think sometimes it's important to have guided uh, interventions. And so getting to understand how, uh, because we know with contact networks, it's also very important to understand which areas are dense and which areas are sparse. And so then the government would decide, assuming if it's vaccination, then where exactly do they, do they prioritize? Demographically, who do they start with? Is it children in school? Then they would get to the school layers. Is it the elderly who stay with the, uh, who are dependents and they stay within a space whereby they're so predisposed, then uh, they would have an idea of who exactly do they want to, to start with. So... We feel our work around understanding the contact networks is very important because then um, it will be very clear on where do we start with and who do we target. And that's very important specifically for the Kenyan case because we have a lot of slum areas huh? uh, where there's a lot of, uh, it's a dense area, it's a densely populated area. And uh, it's also very important for them to have access to different uh, opportunities and healthcare uh, infrastructure. And sometimes, uh, you notice like when there is intervention rollout, then they're nearly the last. And so aggregatively, that does not necessarily help to address the dynamic spread of uh, an infection. Uh, if the government had clarity on the same, and this is something that policymakers would, would pick empirically as important for them to know that uh, when we're picking onto this intervention, then it's very important we start from a densely populated area, then we're able to control the infection. And maybe at times, we don't even have to get to the sparsely populated areas. Yeah. I just wanted to add on something small to the team. That is Eva Akurutuzi, uh, malaria vaccination among under fives. Actually, we had done uh, that very project, but for a small sub-national level called the Bugiri district. We only focus one district and we need a compartmental model. So we motivated the Eva Kut and the team to build deep on that. So we, on 25th, 25th of April this year, it was World Malaria uh, Malaria Day. So we our abstract was accepted by Minister of Health and we presented our malaria vaccination results for that small district called Bugiri to the Minister of Health. And we are very happy to see our results. Yeah, so that is how we are engaging policymakers with our model outputs. Okay, just to add on the policy makers and the scientific part, so first, in our institution, SEMA, before we do the scientific part, we always get to do the objectives according to the Minister of Health. So we work hand in hand. So even for instance, like the objective we are trying to answer in our group is directly connected to the question that is coming from the Minister of Health. And also when it comes to the social, mostly when you're modeling the neglected tropical diseases, they're already affecting a specific population, which is the poor. So it's not just the scientific part, but we are working hand in hand with the policymakers. Another question? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, no, thanks again to all the presenters. Fantastic work uh, to see happening in uh, in the setting where some of us are coming from in the region. So thank you very much. And that's uh, the support as well from uh, the Gates Foundation. I suppose the question that she did ask really covers some of the concerns that I had as well. Um, well I had a question for Ebo, uh, for uh, for uh, Evans, and uh, the the last one on the zero on the zero vaccination. Um, having interaction with the policymakers is really important, and that uh, kind of uh, the top-down approach is really important. First of all, to find out the gaps from the the ministry, um, because oftentimes what happens with the researchers is we have this fascinating you know question that we have, and you know we try to address it, and afterwards you know we kind of shove it to the policymakers. I found this quite ex exciting, you know, take it on board, and they, wait a minute, this is not our priority. So it's really important to start with the top-down. So. Really excellent to, to hear that. But uh, just a question or maybe a reflection on the um, on the uh, zero dose vaccination. So I've heard about uh, the uh, costing that would done, be done on the um, um, on the vaccine on the um, rather uh, the, uh, the the one that Ebo you were talking about that you do the costing on the male on the male side. I'm not able, but uh, Evans. Sorry, I'm switching the names here. Uh, yeah, I think on 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 your end, yeah. So on the costing, on the costing bit. So that's really great on the male involvement, as well as the travel uh, to and from the uh, health care centres. Uh, but uh, for you, uh, on the uh, zero uh, vaccination, I don't know. Is it the cost effectiveness going to be considered as well on your end? Uh, because efficacy and effectiveness is really important. Uh, but I don't know if I. You're factoring in as well the cost effectiveness. Uh, so that when you go to the policymakers, at least you show the um, the value for money that the intervention is bringing, as opposed just to the costing. Yes, uh, thank you for that input. Um, we didn't include it in our model, but it's a good point that uh, we're going to present it. We're going to include that. Oh, sure. Uh, we're at time. So um, I actually would love, though, uh, for folks who were at the training in Nairobi in April, including IDMers, if you could just give a show of hands um, so that folks in the room, if they want to talk to you, if you have burning questions about these um, uh, modeling workshops or if you have burning questions for our participants, um, who were so engaged in the workshop in April, um, please do seek them out, uh, find them. I'm volunteering you all uh, to sort of have mingling and chatting in the aftermath. We would love while they're here uh, to get some context with uh, the modeling community here uh, uh, while you're here as well. Maybe we can just have everyone who just raised their hand come up so we can take a picture before we go to lunch too. Thank you.